Welcome back everyone to the GGBL. In today's episode, we have phase two of the off season. If you guys missed phase number one, it is up in the right hand corner. So make sure you guys go check that out. Basically, phase one was just talking about an introduction of the off season, how it's gonna work, what are some of the rules of the GGBL, how does exclusive free agents work, how does the free agent process work, where do custom prospects come into this? That was all explained in phase one last video of the GGBL offseason. So in phase two, here we are, we're going to be talking about the exclusive free agents. So we're actually going to go dig in here and I'm going to offer some explanation on why teams are going to be letting players go in this format here. So again, just as a re-explanation re here, everyone that falls into an exclusive free agent bucket, so to speak, I'll see this Escobar, Tim Beckham. He was actually, Tim Beckham actually had a pretty decent season for the Atlanta Sting, but he is going to test free agency. Erasmo Ramirez as well is going to test free agency. So these are guys who are just examples. Wilmer Flores, for example, is going to test free agency as a 72 overall player. He hit 278, 23 homers, 90 ribbies. He was a good player. He's going to be highly sought of in that free agent pool this offseason so that's going to be in phase three when we start looking at free agency well the ggbl wants to make sure that there's competitive balance across the board so what we do in free agency so once we actually go past this day so as you guys see in the upper left hand corner free agency is in one day and we move on to the next phase hence the star and the calendar once we move forward all these players that are in this exclusive free agent bucket, so players that have reached zero on their contract length, they're going to be dumped into the free agent pool. So basically, if Wilmer Flores wanted to go back to Miami, Wilmer Flores would have to land on the Miami Moonshots when we do when we do the wheel spin. So basically, that's just another way, like I said, to kind of capture that player choice and that player decision making because I don't want to be involved in that. I think, again, you could probably you could probably blame me for, you know, trying to cheese things and, you know, rig things. I don't want that to happen, right? So you got to have some sort of way in order to kind of let the universe decide how it's all going to play out. Because, again, if I wanted to say, like, well, you know, Atlanta is not going to sign three guys that contributed to their team anymore, but the Richmond good boys, we're going to sign all of our guys. We're going to sign Marcana for sure. Um, you know, Miami's going to sign all Wilmer Flores back. But, you know, so sorry, so sad for Atlanta. Everybody left, right? That's not, that's, that's not a good decision-making process, and that's just not fair, right? So you got to come up with a fair way. Plus, you don't want to just re-sign everybody all the time right because then that gets kind of weird too how, how realistic is that let's talk about the staff situation so I've gone through and I've actually gone through and I've hired all the open positions and as you guys kind of kind of saw in the last episode I fired every major league manager except for Dave Martinez because he won the championship right so what had happened in the early going of this creation of this league when I started year number one and we got into the season I started making gameplay videos and I was actually capturing like mound visits and things with actual MLB managers like Don Mattingly was out there Mike Schilt was out there Tony La Russa and it just didn't make sense because then it kind of broke immersion a little bit like why are these major league managers like highly thought of managers over here why would they move over to the GGBL and you got guys like Mike Trout and Ronald Acuna still playing in the MLB. Like, what was so lucrative about the GGBL becoming a manager out here, right? So it didn't make a lot of sense. So what I went, what I, what I did, what I went through, is obviously you do have some teams that are still open with with contract offers to staff, like hitting coach, pitching coach, first base. I think a lot of these guys are fake coaches, so they were on one-year deals in year one. So in 2020. They were already on one-year deals. Sorry, 2021, they were already on one-year deals. So those expired. Now Washington has to fill those. So I actually went through and looked at their open positions, and then I submitted offers for their open positions. I wanted to leave guys like Dave Roberts out, Joe Madden out, Gabe Kapler out, Cash out. You guys get the idea, right? So I tried to find custom coach-looking dudes to try to manage these teams. 
Now the open spots for managers right now, that's gonna get fixed. That is on manual right now because I wanted to make sure that if you turn this to CPU, if you turn this to auto, the CPU will probably remove this offer for this guy, Ramon Romero, and start going after guys like Dave Roberts. And the whole objective of this is I don't want these guys to be hired. Okay, so we talked about, we'll talk about rebrand after I talk about the exclusive free agents. We talked about reviewing the staff so you guys kind of know what's coming there. Let's dive into the exclusive free agents and talk about a little bit about kind of a little, a little free agency preview, just a little one, and talk about like what the Chicago Breeze are losing, what the Columbus Cardinals are losing. Like, let's talk about the needs of the team. So Logan Forsyth hit 275 was a key cog on this team, a D potential. They're not really, no, they're not losing too much, I guess. Losing an older player, 35 years old. Decent hitter for them, hit that 270 mark. Ruben Tejada did not get called up this season. Actually, let's see. He played in 26 games. 218 batting average. No home runs. That's not what he does. One stolen base. Just didn't get a lot of time, right? Uh, Vizcaino, I think he was used quite often. He had 38 games, 8 holds, 493, 164. So not losing a ton either in that situation for Chicago. Now, the middle infield, obviously, is what I'm looking at here for Chicago. So let's take a look at their middle infield real quick and see what do they have coming up. Well, they got Xavier Edwards coming up. They've obviously got Joe Cronin down there at a C. And then losing Logan Forsythe, again, is not the worst thing in the world for them. Xavier Edwards likely to come up next season for year two. Am I gonna review every single team like I just did Chicago guys in this video? I don't think I can get, I don't think I can jam pack all of that in. You're talking about maybe one minute preview for each team. That's 30 minutes right there. So let's just quickly run through. And that way, I'm hoping you guys, when you see these lists, you can kind of start thinking that way, that that's what these, that's what these teams are probably gonna wanna do in free agency is address trying to fill the void that's left from Robbie Ray now leaving. Yomer Sanchez. And now, Indiana only losing Shelby Miller, you know, that's not bad. He had 4 1 8, 1 4 5, not the end of the world there. He did go 8 and 4, probably something to think about. Wisconsin losing Chris Rusin, Minnesota, Brett Lawry, Corey Guerin, Logan Morrison, who was down in the minor leagues. Chasen Shreve, probably gonna be a pretty big loss there. Yeah, it was a big loss. Chasen Shreve, 25 holds for Santa Fe, 252 and a 102. That's that's gonna hurt them, I think, this season. They're they're really gonna need to hit free agency hard. And even the draft. They're gonna need to hit the draft hard for pitching, I think, is uh, is one of the big cogs for Seattle. Or uh, I should say Santa Fe. I almost said, yeah, I almost said Seattle. They're in the AL West, so that's where my brain's at right now. But let's move over here to Oklahoma. Delino DeShields Jr., Steven Souza, and Brian Holiday. Now, a guy like John Jay, I think I moved his numbers down. No, I didn't. He's just naturally a 55. He lost a lot of progression. <laughs> look, at the, look at the regression for John Jay at 37. You know, that's that hits you hard, man. But Delino DeShields, be a big loss for them if they can't get a can't get him back to 80 batting average 10 stolen bases in limited time only 72 games for the Hawks Steven Souza 243 15 homers you know probably could have had a little bit better of a season he was a starter for most for most of the year probably could have gotten a little bit extra production out of him but you know I think that they'll be fine I think that Delano DeShields loss is probably gonna sting just a little bit unless they can figure out outfield. So outfield's gonna be a position of need here for Oklahoma. Going over here to Las Vegas, this is gonna be a big one, guys. So Dominic Leon, he pitched in 57 games, had 36 holds, but look at that ERA, man, 704. Oh my God, 704 in 57 games, 47 and a third, whole 37 innings, guys. That is, oof. Dominic Leon is, uh, He's going to have to go somewhere where he's got a good defense behind him in a big ballpark because that's not a good season. Now, Johnny Cueto, 15-11 and 11 for the Nuggets, 19 home runs. There's actually not a lot of home runs. Get, well, for Johnny Cueto, it's about average. 
a little bit of below average there, but 3-4-0, uh, 119, 19 quality starts. Cueto will yet again be another solid pitcher for somebody that wants pitching. I think maybe Santa Fe probably going to try to go after Johnny Cueto. Now looking at Seattle, Blake Parker, Tyler Clippard, Matt Latos. That's going to be kind of a big blow. A lot of pitchers coming off the board here for Seattle. And uh, Blake Parker was good, man. 3 4 0, 1 2 4. 26 holds. Not bad. Tyler Clippard, 43 saves. It's a lot of saves, man. It's a lot of saves. Tyler Clippard, that would be a career high for him. So I think a lot of teams might be looking at Tyler Clippard thinking he's going to be a good GGBL pitcher. They might want to. Uh, go look at that. Now, Phoenix is losing a ton of talent. They got Corey Knebel, Charlie Culberson was really good for him um, as a second baseman. You know, 32 years old, 242, 12 homers. He was all right. Colin McHugh, Danny Santana, and Robinson Chirinos. Now, we've seen Chirinos hit a lot of home runs in gameplay. 20 homers, 55 ribbies, 232. That's going to be kind of a blow. Uh, Danny Santana had 283. So that matched his output in 2019 in real life at the MLB level, but it didn't match his 2014 rookie season at 319. But it was one of his better seasons as a pro. 24 doubles, 27 doubles in his rookie year. Yeah, I think uh, Danny Santana refound himself out here in the GGBL, and he might be a decent little player to, uh, to add for someone out there looking for middle infield. Uh, we talked about Atlanta here, Tim Beckham, Escobar, I don't think played a whole lot. Nope, he didn't even play. Rasmus Ramirez went 13 and 10, 391, 134. He'll be sought after as a solid number two, number three GGBL pitcher. Talked about Miami with Wilmer Flores. Marcana will be a blow for us, for the good boys. Had 23 homers for us, 35 doubles. That would be a career high for Marcana. And he blew that number out of the water. Almost reached his career high in homers at 26, but it was a career year in ribbies for Marcana and walks. That's primarily due to the fact that he played every single game. 162 games played for Marcana. So, yeah, that's going to be a big blow for us. And if you guys want to look, for those of you that are good boys fans, the outfield situation for us is not too bad. You got Yara Munoz, Casey Golden still on the team, Kyle Lewis... Marcana will be gone, but Joe Adele at 22, so we're kind of moving on from Marcana then. I don't think that we're hoping that we get him back in a wheel spin, but Marcana at 33, and uh, Joe Adele coming up as a 67 and an A with a lot of progression. Now, he did get a September call up and played in eight games, hit a homer at 364, two stolen bases. I'm looking forward to some Joe Adele here for the Richmond Good Boys, so we'll see how that all plays out, but... Let's go back here to the exclusive free agents to talk about the other teams here. And we got D Strange Gordon, Daniel Hudson, 270, man. 270 in the pen with a 1 5. So he was pretty decent. D Strange Gordon, I'm just going to say D Gordon, 225. So doing D Gordon things, had 39 stolen bases. Yeah, I mean, just doing D Gordon things. I think that Philadelphia can live without. D Gordon I really do you know the the ratings a little bit at a 75 it might be a little bit of an optical illusion I guess you know when you're hitting 225 and not a lot of power 11 home runs that's like that's a career high though so I, I take that back but it's got a lot to do with the fact that the GGBL is got a bunch of stadiums that are a lot smaller than the MLB so you know you, you take that for what it's worth but a 275 OVP is not what a team like Philadelphia needs. They're in rebuild mode. They got to focus on guys that uh, that can help them like today. I don't think D Gordon really helps them today. You know, let's look back here. He's 33. Yeah, they need to focus on that youth movement out there in Philly. But TJ McFarland, he did not get any GGBL action. So Carolina GGBL champions, not really going to be worried about that. But Dallas is losing a notable name here in Kyle Seeger. Oof. So they went all in to go get a guy like Kyle Seager for that playoff push, and they ended up not making the playoffs. So you guys remember, they had to play one game in game 162 against St. Louis, and whoever won that game in 162 
not a tie in 163, but game 162, it came down to that series between Dallas and St. Louis, and St. Louis beat them. Dallas went all in to try to get to the playoff push and win that NL Central, and they went out and they went out and they acquired Kyle Seeger for that push, but, you know, they're going to lose him. They're going to lose him due to the GGBL rule, and he actually went off this season. You know, found a found a renaissance here in the GGBL with 26 homers, 273, had been kind of had that middling batting average, 240, 220, 230, 240, and finally came to the GGBL and had a really good Kyle Seeger type of season. But he's going to be a notable name in free agency this year, and uh, we'll see which team picks him up. Adam Morgan, 185 with 28 holds at a 103 and 43 and two-thirds innings. So this was uh, one of his, eh, I wouldn't say higher work, worked innings in a season. 2015, 2016 were his higher years. But, you know, as a lefty, he's going to be sought after as a 69. Josh Reddick, 259, 20 home runs. That would be a, uh, it's a tie with his second best season of his career. 2012 obviously being the best year. But uh, 259, 72 walks. Let's see how many walks. That's, that should be a career high. 72 walks. Man, oh man. So Josh Reddick should be a player that probably a bench player at this point for a GGBL team. Probably a rebuilding team. Maybe Philadelphia might want to consider Josh Reddick at 35. Would be more of a hitter than D. Gordon for sure. So he'd be a guy that uh, they're looking at. Mike Morin, Jeremy Jeffress. We're not, maybe I don't need to necessarily look too much at their statistics here. 31 saves for Mike Morin, 247, 118. Only 30 strikeouts and nine walks in 47 to third innings. He's not going to strike a lot of people out. Like, that's just not Mike Morin's thing, right? His best pitch is his changeup. Two seamer, four seamer, only hitting low 90s. Not going to strike out a bunch of people. As you guys can see, the caper nine for Mike Morin is uh, a 48. All right, so he's not, that's not, just not his game. Jeremy Jeffress was terrible, 6'11", 161, so he's probably on the on the way out, probably a limited appearance type of player for some team, maybe a playoff type team, looking for that playoff push next season. But uh, as Drupal Cabrera, still kicking, man, 37 years old, going on 37 at 100 hits this year, 12 homers, 44 ribbies. 281, probably a bench player at this point, even though he's a 74. I think he's going to be a bench guy coming off the bench in a situation where he's got to hit against lefties, right? 80 contact, 61 power. I think that that's really where he fits because, uh, yeah, 12 homers, you need a little bit more pop from a guy that's going to be, you know, an everyday starter at that point who's 36. You're probably better off playing a younger guy in that situation if you're only going to get that type of production. 12 and 44 and 40. Not 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 enough in my opinion. Yeah, it gets on base 356 281, but at 36 in the GGBL, <laughs> I'm looking at starting a younger guy, getting more progression, maybe using his dribble in more um, clutch type of spots, right? Chris Herman had some nice progression throughout the year. Three homers, 264, had 37 games played, so he's still remains a type of a bench guy Chaz Rowe Tyson Ross and Neftali Feliz this is gonna this is gonna hurt the pitching staff for New Orleans and I've ultimately guys I've made the decision here too um and maybe I should lead this to a vote for you guys but I'm I'm really leaning to the fact that I think I think Trevor Bauer needs to go bye-bye yeah I, I, I just do I think you know, let me know in the comment section what you want to see happen with that situation because that's just it's an awkward situation man if trevor bauer just does something good here in this series and i gotta call it out like oh trevor bauer you're so amazing like eh. <laughs> it's still a little rocky right now i haven't been keeping up too much with that situation but let me know in the comment section what you guys want to do about the trevor bauer situation and if you well let me word it this way if, if you want to leave it up to a vote place that in the comment section if you want to leave it up to a vote and then i'll I'll get, a, I'll get a form out there for you guys. You can fill it out. You can let me know how you feel about it. If you want Trevor Bauer still in this in this league or you're not, then we, we'll decide it as a community. We'll decide together what we want to do. But, um, yeah, either way, Chaz Rowe, Tyson Ross, and Neftali Feliz, this is going to be, you know, this, is, this might hurt the 
New Orleans swing, especially if we decide that uh, Trevor Bauer is not going to be around anymore. But 50 saves for Chaz Rowe. I mean, this he's never even had more than two. <laughs> more than one, I should say. <laughs> I mean, he had 68 holds in his entire career, and then he pops in with 50 saves. So Chaz Rowe at uh, 35 had a career season with saves. Sam Freeman and Danny Salazar. Danny Salazar was an addition from the San Diego Defenders out in the NL, and they acquired an NL pitcher. They moved him over back over here to the NL with St. Louis, and he went 3-11 total across the board from St. Louis and San Diego, but I don't know how many teams would be interested in Danny Salazar. He might be a bullpen guy at this point at 31, and hitting 92 94 i guess you could have him as a number four or five starter at this point but you know that that record is not good three and eleven it might have been the team that he was on too san diego was bad real bad this year but the 83 walks to 126 strikeouts the two to one you want it you want to see like closer to like three to one maybe two and a half to one really sam freeman 0 and 6 21 holds 404 one three so he was decent Probably not going to be well sought after in the free agent market. Ryan Goins was part of a trade from Atlanta, and he ended up hitting 239 total. No stolen bases for Ryan Goins. I would have thought he was a little faster, but apparently not with that 34 speed. Scott Casimir did not. Ooh, I misspoke. He did come up to Portland, went 8 and 9. Was part of the bullpen, had five blown saves, two holds. Four and five, one, six, one. So at 38 years old, I don't think many people might be looking at him, but Luis Avilan was a player that they used often. He had he was in 52 games, had 52 appearances, 244, 138. That's gonna be a big blow for Colorado. Luis Garcia as well. Another bullpen arm that they're gonna be missing. So something that uh Colorado probably want to focus on here in free agency is relief pitching. Ender Inciarte will be testing free agency as well. Not by his choice, though. At 248, and probably a probably be a good thing for Ender Inciarte at 69. Nice. At 31 years old, 85 vision. He he's gonna be sought after for sure as a nice little outfielder, little chip in type of outfielder. He actually played decently in let's see, 117 games, so I would say even limited time. Limited time. Now, that, that outfield's crowded with Luis Basabe. We'll look at it here, but this outfield's pretty crowded, guys. You've got Conforto, Castellanos, Basabe, Eric Pena, 18 with an A, Ryan Braun's over there now, Drew Avens, like Enciarte at 31 years old, maybe even Ryan Braun, like these guys, I mean, Ryan Braun's going to start because he's Ryan Braun, right? But Ender Enciarte probably thinking that he's going to have a, a good shot signing somewhere else and getting more playing time. Brad Brock also going to be going bye-bye for San Diego. 309, 133, and 29 holds. This one actually really hurts. This one really hurts. Now, San Francisco had a huge drop-off last season, but this one hurts, man. Evan Gaddis at 77. Cole Calhoun. I, I take that back about Cole Calhoun. <laughs> I don't think they're going to miss Cole Calhoun. 204. Like, that's, ugh, it's not, it's terrible. 11 homers, 48 ribbies. He didn't really do much, man seven doubles i've seen cole calhoun do a lot better than that like 2016 13 14 he had some pretty good years out there for the angels and then just all of a sudden just boom just everything dropped off i think it's the age you know you start uh start losing a little bit of your your strength when you start swinging man you can't you can't react as fast your, your reaction time goes goes down as you get older Chris Davis, 234. I don't know how many home runs that he hit with San Francisco or how many home runs he hit total with Santa Fe. But either way, 27 homers, 86 ribbies, and 162 games. So between playing the outfield and playing designated hitter, you know, Chris Davis will be another valuable target in free agency. Justin Bohr was acquired through trade from Santa Fe as well, a part of the Chris Davis trade. And he played 99 games total, 14 homers. I think Bohr is a sneaky little ad. Definitely as maybe like a bench player that comes up in pinch hitting spots, maybe even a platoon situation for a, a team, but definitely something to look at, keep track of. But Derek Dietrich, 
224, 15 homers, 59 ribbies as well. He's gonna be a he's gonna be he's gonna be missed there for San Francisco as well. Washington only losing two players: Renee Rivera, AJ Ramos, Jordan Lyles, and Derek Holland, two players here for Boston. And then the runner-ups to the GGBL champion, Carolina Blue Sox, Tommy Hunter, the GGBL or I guess professional baseball, if you wanted to include that, professional baseball playoff saves leader. He holds the record. He holds the record. We covered that in the World Series. But 52 saves for Tommy Hunter, 213.84. Microscopic whip, man. 0.84. He's testing free agency. So any team that needs a bullpen arm, he's probably going to be the top tier candidate. Brett Anderson, that's a big loss for them. 11 and 6 this season, 37312. Veteran arm, veteran lefty, he's going to be missed as well. Jason Kipnis, Mike Montgomery, Jesse Hahn, Jordan Zimmerman. A lot of pitching here for Pittsburgh that has been lost. And uh, Mike Montgomery, 9 and 10, 354, 12. So these aren't bad numbers. It's decent numbers, but yeah, they're going to be they're going to be hurting for that. Uh, nine homers here for Kipnis, 247, 35 ribbies. I think that they can focus elsewhere on middle infield. Marcus Simeon, this was a player that actually had his ratings cut down. So he hasn't, he's not even really a part of this uh, GGBL universe. But now we're back to square one. So what I want to talk about now here really quick, guys, is players like Starlin Castro at a 22 overall. Uh, of course, Marcus Simeon at a 31. Chris Archer, 18. What are some other players here that are pretty good? Jose Iglesias at a 21. So these guys are all going to be in the free agents. I will end up manually signing them to teams. The teams that I sign them to, like Tucker Barnhart, these are not going to be teams that they transfer to, so to speak. So like if we decide in year number three that Alex Wood and Di Sclafani are gonna be part of the GGBL, I'm not gonna just send them here to San Francisco, right? So they'll be removed. They'll be put in the free agents as well. They'll be released just like, let's say, just like uh, Mike Zanino was and Trevor Story was. Just like these guys were, they'll go into the free agents and they'll basically be like, Oh, these guys are coming over to the GGBL in year three, right? So the, the big thing is, is kind of like what we talked about with Mike Trout. He was in the play in the playoffs, he was in the free agent pool. And as you guys know, in the playoffs, you can't sign players from the free agent pool. So him having like a five overall or whatever it was, he ended up retiring due to poor ability. So I don't want that to happen with players like De Sclafani or let's see, like Brad Miller would be a nice little guy to add over here. Um, Andrew Chafin, everybody loves themselves. Some <laughs> Andrew Chafin. Uh, let's see, anybody else? Like Yachty, Yachty or Molina. He's getting older, right? 39 years old. He could probably end his MLB career next season and say, I want to play in the GGBL. Yachty at like a 70 overall or something would be fun to watch, I think. So, you know, as long as they're on a team, they're not going to get sent to free agents. They're not going to just retire on you. You can go in and you can edit those players and make sure that they don't retire, right? So that's how I'm going to work it. And that's just kind of what I wanted to explain to you guys about that. So without further ado, let's talk about the rebranded teams with uniforms, with logos, and stadiums. Who won your votes? We'll talk about that. And then once we get done with that, guys, we're going to move on to free agency and then move on to a preview of phase three all right guys so here's your results of the new logo new uniform design and new stadium so let's talk about the logo first we had a very close vote i was a little disappointed with the number of responses we only had 34 maybe the off-season video was just too long and nobody really understood this process but 34 responses man I was wishing, I was hoping like maybe 60, maybe 70 to kind of get a better feel for what you guys are thinking about and what you guys wanted to see. But either way, man, either way, we've got Seattle with 10, nine for San Francisco and LA with eight. So very close vote, but Seattle will win to get the new logo. Now I do in fact like their primary logo with the jewel or with the actual emerald in it with the baseball field in the back with the script writing there 
But I think what you guys are really asking for with a change for Seattle is like the S, the hat, the hat logo up there. I think you guys are thinking that that needs to change, at least the lettering, the script, emeralds, Seattle. I think you guys are thinking that that needs to change. And that'll be something that I actually work with you guys on throughout the season. So I'll come up with concepts, I'll come up with ideas, and then you guys can let me know in the comment section if you like it or if you don't. And then we'll just kind of go from there. I kind of gauge the feedback of Seattle's concepts. And once we kind of go with an idea, I'll send that concept over to Kasabe and he will end up creating that. I'll have to I'll have to pay him for it though. But so but that's a it's a worthy thing to go pay a guy for that. Thank you, Kasabe, for for creating a lo for creating logos for me for this league. But that's probably who I'm gonna go with in order to create that logo. And um they'll be ready they'll be ready for year number three so these logo changes and uniform designs will not happen for year two what we voted on was for year three the stadium updates will happen for year two so i've got a little something here for you guys in just a moment but let's move on to uniform design it was not a very close vote here we had 12 votes for la nine votes for philly so la is going to end up getting a new uniform design if you guys want to send me links maybe for new like baseball jersey concepts and things like that some cool ideas maybe i can kind of come up with something that at, within the show you can only do so much with jersey design so i'll try to make something that's closer to what you guys might be thinking about with jersey designs for la but maybe you guys didn't like the pinstripes i'm not sure exactly um i think la uniforms are kind of cool but I know some people have mentioned in comments and mentioned in Discord that LA should change their uniforms. So, you know, let me know in the comment section. Was it if you voted for LA in this voting, like what was it about LA that you felt needed to change? Was it the pinstripes? Was it the lettering? Kind of matching with the pinstripes. It's got red lettering with knights in Los Angeles, and it just kind of, you know, you kind of miss the lettering with the pinstripes. Is that really what it was? I don't know. You guys let me know in the comment section. But let's move on over here to stadiums. We've got 29.4 for Santa Fe. So 10 votes for Santa Fe and 26.5% for Philadelphia. Got nine votes. So a little, a little nugget here is what I'm going to do for year number two. Philadelphia will end up getting a new stadium regardless if they had lost the vote, which they did. We are going to go grab a stadium custom built by Kasabe love this guy he custom built this stadium for philadelphia at the beginning of the year once he learned about the league and once he was starting to create logos for the league yeah yep so we're gonna do that for him we're gonna throw we're gonna throw him a bone and say thank you and we're also going to uh give that to philadelphia so i mean how can you go wrong with that right it's got an owl statue in the back there it's got a freaking plane in center field <laughs> i mean right next to the batter's eye it's perfect perfect it fits philadelphia the flight perfectly so that's what we're going to do for philadelphia either way santa fe won the vote outright with 10 votes compared to phillies nine so barnes canyon ballpark will be replaced that's a san diego studios creation we're going to replace that stadium with something custom built and i'm actually going to show you guys what stadium that's going to be right now Welcome everyone to Santa Fe Yard. This is actually created by someone from the community that I don't know of. It's just another custom stadium that was built. And you can see guys in the stadium section of the GGBL Bible or the roster sheet, the Excel file. If you go all the way to the pretty much the end of the Excel file, there's a tab called Stadium Details. And you can go find all of the GGBL custom stadiums that have been built by me and even the stadiums that have been built by other community members that, you know, I didn't ask for permission for anything. You know, these are already out here for download. Um, I don't think that there's any sort of issue with downloading custom stadiums or anything, but I'm, I'm, citing, I'm citing their username here in the comment section as well as the Excel file. So if you guys wanna go ahead and find that user who created this stadium this was created by kfc deja vu uh yeah kfc does give me some deja vu sometimes man it does always taste the same however this is called santa fe yard 
and I think it's a pretty cool stadium. It's got, you know, that big wall out there in right, so they're kind of copying Carolina at this point. This is a really bad team. Santa Fe was one of the worst teams in the GGBL, and now that they've really understood that, hey, man, if we get a big green wall out here, I think that this stadium really fits with how the league champs won a World Series or a championship. So Santa Fe is looking at that like a copycat league type thing, and I think that this just works. So they've got a big wall out there and right. I love the I love the the scenery here with the red rock. Love the big scoreboard out here. The lights seem to make sense with that scoreboard behind the rock. You got that silo up here too. You got that concert area back there. I think it's fun. I think it's a really cool stadium, and it really adds a lot of. Uh, a lot of flavor here to the GGBL. Now, admittedly, Santa Fe, New Mexico, does not have a ton of red rock. Where the city is at, it's a lot of green. It's a lot of green, it's a lot of shrubbery, it's a lot of hills. But I think, I don't wanna tweak this too much. I think that this is just a cool concept and I think you guys can get past the background. I think you can appreciate just how cool that this stadium actually is. and it does give a western type of vibe to it i think i want to stick with it even though santa fe around the city is mostly green and very hilly versus very rocky not like arizona or colorado pretty much so i still want to keep this so the altitude i had to change because this was actually created for santa fe california not santa fe new mexico so i did change this to match the elevation out there in Santa Fe is 7,199 feet of elevation. And as you saw, you have to do it as 5280. So that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna keep. Under 5280. Okay, 5279. There we go. Alright, so here we are previewing phase three. Okay, we're previewing phase three. Phase two, we're still in it. We're still in it. Phase two is tender contracts, arbitration negotiations, rebranding team votes, reviewing the staff, and exclusive free agent negotiations like we just saw in the last part of this video. I want to get all these players under contract right now. And what I've done is I've gone through and I've actually signed everybody that I possibly could or actually you know, offered a contract to. I've offered a contract to everybody I possibly could except for everybody 59 and below. I did that for every single team, including my my hated rival, the Carolina Blue Sox. I even did it for them. And this is just a snapshot. I'm not gonna cover a whole lot of what happened here with all these teams. Just know that anybody that was a 60 or above, I went back in and I offered them a contract. Anybody below that, 59 or below, didn't matter if you're A potential or B potential, whatever, I did not offer you a contract. What we're going to do now is now that, like I mentioned, everybody here has been offered a contract all the way up above 60 plus, 59 and below was not offered a contract. We are going to go ahead and simulate until we get everybody pretty much signed through arbitration. We offered them these deals and tender contracts. They've accepted those tenders. That way I can get through here, guys, and talk to you about the trades. Because as you guys can see here, I can't actually offer Hunsu Kim to a team because he's not even on a contract. We're still in arbitration negotiation, right? I can't even offer Rob Brantley a deal because I believe he is also in arbitration. There you go. Sebi Zavala, let's see if we can offer him in a trade. Can we offer Zavala in a trade? We can't because he's not on a contract. So we have to tender him, he has to accept, and then he would be available to be traded. So really what, what I'm doing there is I'm making sure that the trade opportunities are optimized in order for a team to actually get a player's real worth. We can, we can keep simming until a lot of these players are signed up. And fortunately for us, I have all of the transaction type of things set to manual. So no team is possibly going to sign or offer anybody in the free agent list any deals at all because we've got we've got we've got to the winter meetings to make any type of move. So let's go ahead and simulate and we will figure out 
what these trade offers are going to look like. All right, so here we are at December 2nd. And just a little update here, guys. I did advance into well into December to figure out if these guys end up do signing contracts. And most of them do. So, you know, a guy like Connor Myers, if he doesn't sign with Boston, I mean, I did everything I could. I got to manage 30 teams here. So I did everything I could to try to sign a guy like that. Connor Myers at a 64. But for the most part, guys that are key contributors did sign back over, like just... John Eshwee Fargus, Grulian at a 69. I know for a fact that uh, Royce Lewis signs over. Um, another example, Asa Lacey does sign back over. Another player, let's see, another big time player up on the board would be Ryder Jones. He does sign back over. Anthony Bemboom. So I'm not too worried about these players moving on and um, moving past this stage. So that's pretty much it, guys. It's That's pretty much it for uh, tendering contracts and arbitration. So let's just go right into, and there's a manager offer. So let's actually just dive right into the winter meetings and talk to you guys about who's up on the board for trade talks. So we'll get into that here in just a moment. And as you guys can see really quickly, we did get Gurian. He's on a contract, one year out of three. Uh, let's see, did Ben Boom sign? Ben Boom did sign one year out of five. So Susac is, I think Susac is under arbitration talks. Let's see what Nolan Jones did, or Ryder Jones. So one year out of five, that's perfect. And another example here, maybe Casey Golden. Let's see what he did. Did Casey Golden sign? He did, so one year out of three. So I think we're pretty much set. Um, one other player, let's see, Asa Lacey real quick. Asa Lacey, one year out of three, that's good. And then we had shortstop CJ Abrams, and he signed as well. So looking over the trade offers and the things that I had in mind has got me thinking a little bit. Maybe I need to alter this offseason of the way that we do this because trade talks, we could easily do and pull trades off in the even in preseason. We could do that. Like in spring training, we could pull off a trade. It doesn't matter when we do it. Probably before the first game starts in spring training would be best. But pretty much after that, the offseason's done, right? Then you can pull trades off whenever you want. So what I'm thinking, guys, is that we actually just go ahead and we go into free agency. And we preview free agency. We wheel spin it in the next video. I might consider doing it on a live stream. Let me know in the comment section if you'd like to do it on a live stream. And... I think that's the, the best way to go because if Acuna goes to a team that's got a ton of outfielders, you're probably going to end up trading one of those lesser outfielders. So let's just find a team here really quick and see if like a team like Acuna or a player like Acuna would go to a, a team with a lot of outfielders. Like pretty much everybody would accept Ronald Acuna. Nobody, not very many teams have a 90 plus outfielder, right? But I mean, let's say he goes to Michigan. For all intents and purposes, let's say he goes to Michigan. Dylan Carlson, Daniel Palka, Oscar Mercado, Alex McKenna, Cole Roderer. These guys are in their mid-70s right now. And Roderer is a 21-year-old player. He'd probably be the one guy that you'd trade, would be Cole Roderer. You might be able to get rid of Oscar Mercado, but, you know, kind of why would you do that, right? He's your one of your better outfielders with A potential. He's 27. He offers some good defense. Dylan Carlson, you want to keep Daniel Palka. It'd probably have to be Palka or Cole Roeder as a guy you would trade. But you would only do that if you got Ronald Acuna on your team, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it makes more sense to go inside here and preview free agency. So let's go ahead and do that, and then we'll talk. We'll do trades a little bit later on after the offseason has begun. So I know I wanted to get you guys involved in the trade discussion, but I just think it makes maybe more sense to get through the offseason, and then we can talk about doing trades in spring training, at least before the spring training season begins. So without further ado, let's talk about free agency here real quick, guys. And one thing is worth noting here really quickly some guys like Ross Stripling, we offered him a contract and he didn't take it. So I'm not against guys like declining contracts. So unfortunately for Oklahoma, thinking that they were trying to get Ross Stripling back, 
he decided that he wasn't going to take the offer. So he's now become a free agent and he's able to talk with other teams about a new contract. Same thing here with Brett Anderson. Now, Brett Anderson did not decide that he wanted to go back to New York. I find that kind of interesting. I find that kind of cool. And that little dynamic, it might suck for New York fans and it might suck for Oklahoma fans. But I think you guys are pretty mature about this. You'll get over it, right? So let's first talk about starting pitching. And again, how the wheel spins are going to work. And we'll talk about this when I live stream it. If you guys want me to do that, let me know in the comment section. If it's over flooding with comments that you want that free agency to be live streamed, then we're probably going to do it that way. But again, how we're going to do this is that there's a 90 tier bracket. And every single team, again, will be on that wheel spin. And then we'll decide where Acuna is going to go and then where Tyler Glass now is going to go. Once a team like Michigan takes Acuna, Michigan cannot get Tyler Glass now. They're off the board at that point. Pretty much you're only going to be getting one player per group. So you got to treat these guys as in their own group. Acuna and Glass now would be in their own group. They're in the 90s. Trevor Story all the way down here to Andrew Benatendi would be also in their own group. Theoretically, a team like Michigan, if they got Acuna, they could also get like a guy like Jonathan Scope. So teams can re-enter the wheel spins based on, again, because we've now reset the group. And doing it this way, each team pretty much has a chance to have a big free agency. Some teams have a chance at having a lackluster free agency. Some teams might only get one guy out of the 90s to 80s and 70s group. Now the 70s group is a lot bigger, as you guys can see. So when we start diving into the 70s group, basically every team has to have picked one player before they're now off the board, before they can kind of before they can come back into the next group of players. So really, I mean, we've got over 30 teams. We've got 30 teams and we've got over 30 players here in the 70 group. Basically, the top 30 guys will be selected here from this from this group and then we'll re-enter everybody back in and we'll wheel spin. So technically, Michigan might have a chance at getting 270 plus overall players in the wheel spins. Now for 60s, 60s is tough. It depends on how fast that this goes, this process goes. I think I might just handle the 60 overall players, the 60 plus overall players, and just sign these guys to where I think that they should go to. And uh, let's talk about the let's talk about the preview here, guys. So Tyler Glass, now the best pitcher available, definitely going to be highly sought after. It's going to be very interesting to see where this guy goes. Really good pitcher, man. Plus Zach Wheeler, Madison Bumgarner, now available in the free agents. Johnny Cueto coming out from Las Vegas. Tyler Anderson, again, Ross Stripling. Robbie Ray pitched well for Columbus last season. David Hess was another guy that ended up not taking his contract from Phoenix. So we had a couple guys that actually declined their contract. And uh, Scott Casimir as well, I believe, did not accept. So he actually, I think Scott Casimir was an exclusive free agent, if I remember right. But Shelby Miller was that as well. So just an idea of free agent starting pitching, relief pitching, Kayone Kayla, Tommy Hunter, we talked about him, Jordan Hicks. It's a pretty decent relief pitching group, I would say, like guys like Sean Newcomb, Greg Holland, Emil Encarnacion, must, he might be a young guy, no, 27 years old, D potential. Decent list, actually it's, it's pretty loaded actually in all things considered for GGBL standards. A lot of teams are going to need a lot of relief pitching help. A lot of teams have a lot of mid-60s in their relief pitching. That relief pitching class is going to be pretty, pretty darn good. Now closing pitching, obviously Edwin Diaz is going to be highly sought after by pretty much every team. Every team would need a guy like Edwin Diaz. So whoever signs him is going to be in a pretty good spot to limit the game down to maybe seven innings. That's a good sign for GGBL teams. Now catchers, it's pretty much a one-man show. Mike Zanino at an 86. Yermi Mercedes would be a good add, a young catcher. Victor Caratini would be a nice little sneaky addition. But then it totally drop off, drops off here down to like 55s. 55 levels, so we don't we don't like to see that here. But and there and there's a perfect example, guys. So when you're looking at all players, 
it's uh, it stops at 68, but if you go to starting pitching, it's going to drop down to like the 22s where you see Paxton, Barrios, guys that are still not retired yet. So guys that are still eligible to come over to the GGBL in year number three, which would be kind of cool to see those guys pop in. But first base, a little weak on the first base side of things. Uh, Albert Pujols still doing still doing his thing. I, I would like to see Albert Pujols on a team. I might even get him give him a little bit of a bump. So you know, he's actually worth starting. But Greg Bird, a guy that I really thought was going to do something for Columbus, and he just didn't. Two home runs, 219, just didn't didn't do well, man. G-Man Choi, all right. G-Man Choi is a guy that's coming over from the MLB over to the GGBL. He did not play in 2021, in, uh, 2020, I should say, or 2021. My bad, geez, oh, Pete's. He did not play in 2021 because he wasn't even in the league. But Colin Moran, another guy that comes over from the MLB to the GGBL, which is kind of cool. Rowdy Talese. Let's go to second base. You got Jonathan Scope. Of course, Chad De La Guerra. Or De La Guerra. From St. Louis, again, his stats, 15 bombs, 198. Just I, who knows who's going to sign this guy. Man, I hope that wherever he goes, he has a little bit better of a uh, an outing than that. But D. Gordon, Charlie Culberson, Second base list is pretty solid as well. So you got some good, decent players there. Third base is a little bit more stacked, I think. You got Josh Fuentes there. Good player. Kyle Seeger. Again, as Drupal Cabrera. Testing free agency. Brett Lawry, JT Riddle. Sanchez. And then the likes. Malcolm Nunez. Yeah. Shortstop. A little light, but Trevor Story. All things considered, Trevor Story. Yeah, he's going to be a huge addition for anybody. The big thing is, is whoever signs a guy like Trevor Story, Glassnow, Acuna, they could have a Chicago Breeze style of style of season. Like remember, or even New Orleans, I guess. New Orleans was really good at with pitching with Trevor Bauer, 20, 20 and four Trevor Bauer. Um, I can think of a couple teams like New York. You know, the New York Pizzazz had Bryce Harper. So a guy like Trevor Story could come on into a team and just totally change and shift an entire team's fortunes. So that's going to be pretty cool to watch. But Scott Kingery is also available. Wilmer Flores, pretty pretty solid shortstops. But the outfield is pretty loaded, guys. Lewis Brinson, Eddie Rosario, McCutcheon, Benintendi, Chris Davis, Peraza, Mikey Matuk at 71 overall. Like, ugh. He only played in 21 games. I get it. 113, but... Would like to see a little bit of something better there. But Kevin Kiermeyer, Brandon Nimmo, Ketel Marte. Yeah, outfield is loaded in this free agent class. I'd probably say that outfield is the strongest part of this free agent group in year number one. Ronald Acuna obviously is going to be the first guy taken off the board. We'll have to see just where he lands. And then um, that's it for free agency, guys. So like I said, I'll talk to you guys about trade offers once the season, once the offseason is done and once we're ready, once the rosters are all set, everybody's signed up, people are up on their 40-man rosters. Yeah, I think it's going to be a good offseason. I think uh, the wheel sprints are going to be fun. Let me know in the comment section what you thought about the Phase 2 and the Phase 3 preview, and we'll get into free agency in the next video. It could be a live stream depending on what you guys want to see. And also let me know in the comment section again what you want to do about the Trevor Bauer situation. If you guys want him still remaining in the league or if you want him to go bye-bye. So if you want that to be put up to a vote, I can put it up to a vote. But I really need to know kind of the general feel, the general discussion of what you guys want to do about that situation. Because again, I, I would feel really weird about making commentary based on Trevor Bauer's success in the league you know it just kind of gets a little weird when you start talking about somebody that's in that light right now in that negative light very you start talking about him very positively even though it's pixel version of trevor bauer it just gets a little weird man so let me know in the comments section you want to vote on what to do about him and then in the next video i'll have a poll for you guys i'll have a google form ready for you guys so i can really determine what you guys want to do about that Trevor Bauer situation. But either way, guys, I will see you in phase number three, which will be the free agency wheel spins. And I'll kind of give you a update on how that's all going to work before we actually do the spinning. And just again, just reiterating how the process works and why we're doing it the way that we're doing it. 
And let me know also in the comment section if you would like it to be a live stream. If I get an overwhelming majority of votes that it should be a live stream, then I will definitely be planning that out for this week. Now, just be forewarned, a live stream will take a while. And if there are new people that are wanting to come back to watch that video, to watch that live stream, it's going to be about, it's going to be about maybe an hour, maybe a couple hours long to get through an entire wheel spin of free agency. The benefit though, for both sides, the benefit for doing a wheel spin is that you can see every single thing and every single process that was taking place to get players where they need to go. The downside of a live stream is of course the time that it takes. The benefit for an upload is that it's probably could get condensed into a half an hour. So it's easy to watch, but the downside of it being an upload is you can't see the whole process and you're not really sure if I was being honest about it. You know what I mean? So let me know in the comment section what you guys want to see happen. Either way, I'll see you in phase three, no matter if it's an upload or if it's a live stream. And we'll figure out in this free agent class, where is Tyler Glass now going? Where is Ronald Acuna going? Where's Trevor's story going? We're going to find out. It's going to turn the tide of the GGBL for certain. So guys, I will see you in the next one. Leave a like if you like this thing. As always, thank you for watching and peace.